Well, uh, yes, I, I first came to the UK in 1969. And um, first impression, fantastic. You know, um, I, I couldn't believe it, you know, what I was seeing because uh, from the airport, you know, the taxi driver was, was, was such a gentleman. You know, I could not believe that, you know, you had people like that because I was used, used to New York taxis and Miami taxis and Jamaican taxi. In Jamaica, you can't slam a, a cab guy's door, he'd throw you out of his car, you know. And in New York, the guy just opened his door and said, where, where are you going and pull the thing back and, you know, and that's it. The English guy was, was so such a gentleman, lift my bag, and I was thinking, wow, this is a great place. The cops didn't have no guns. You could stop a cop and have a chat with him, not in New York, you know. So my first impressions were, man, this is a great place, you know. And uh, as soon as I got in, I, I, you know, I was introduced to who is, should become my manager. Uh, he was a great um, jazz player in England uh, called... Um, Dick Katz, uh, and um, he was um, working with um, MAM, which is Music Artists and Management, which at the time was owned by uh, by Tom Jones and Umpenink, and quite a few guys. You know, it was artists, you know, owned. So um, uh, I, I was given, you know, a, a few jobs to work with, with, with these guys, you know, and I came to England because of uh, the, the, a song that was released here on the Bamboo label, which was California Dreaming. Right away, right away, things just started bubbling for me. You know, um, Tony Blackburn took um, the, the song um, California Dreaming and he made it his hit pick of the week. And uh, after that happened, you know, the, the, the record company, which was um, uh, Bamboo, should have pressed enough records to put it out to all the chart buying shops. But uh, uh, the guy had sold so many copies before, and I think he sold over 20,000. Now, he didn't want Mr. Dodd to know that he sold so much records. So when the, 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 the record shop started calling him and asking him for records, he said, oh, the, 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 the stamp has got broken, so I'll have to make new stampers. That will take a couple of weeks, right? So anyway, you know, Tony Blackman was so disgusted, you know, not, you know, to making the, the, the song hit pick of the week, he decided he was going to do it a second time. And that is the first and the only time that it, he ever made a song is hit pick of the week twice. So, big up for Tony Blackwood. <laughs> From that, you know, um, Dick decided to manage me. And um, the first place that he started sending me to was uh, the Bailey's Clubs. Now, in England at, at that time, in you know, um, they they, uh, they had some really big. It, it was the pra the only place that you could really get really good live entertainment. The Bailey's uh, Club, and uh, at, at also in, in, in round about that time, you had um, a, a, a a show. It, it was a, a competition show, like you have the X Factor today, and um, I think the guy name was Green, and. Um, if you won th th this competition, you would get a contract to do the Bailey Circuit. Well, by that time, I had done the Bailey Circuit three times already, you know, and I I I done every club in England. And when you start off, like if you start off in Watford, and then you go to like Birmingham, and to Leeds, by the time you finish the circuit, you know, it's a, like a year, you know. So by the time you get back to the first club, you've done a year's worth of work. And it, it was great fun, you know, because uh, I met so many people, you know, from that, you know, and by this time, you know, more recordings were coming over from Jamaica for me. So it was really, you know, putting me on, on a really nice wage packet. Because at that time, you know, in between 69 to 71, I think um, the average wage was about seven pounds 50. And I was earning like 50, 60, you know, 200 pounds a week. You know, so I was a big boy, man. <laughs> then in 
that time, uh, like, um, it was unheard of for a reggae singer to, to do cabaret. But that is exactly what I was, what I was doing. You know, um, because I wasn't only singing reggae. I was singing songs like My Way. You know, I was doing ballads, you know. And um, working at a club like the Dulce Vida in Birmingham is one of the biggest clubs you had in, in Birmingham. And, well, in, 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 in the north, you know, it was a beautiful club. I, I think uh, it, it, it held about 1,500 people, you know, and most Friday and Saturdays and Sunday nights it would be packed, you know. And you had a, a, a lot of artists who were doing weekly slots in there, you know. So if you went to the, 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 the Dulce Vida, which was also Bailey's Club, you would do like a week, you know. And... Um, Working there was just pure magic, you know, because I would be singing reggae, and I, I remember so, some sometimes you, you say to the band because you didn't take a band round with you. you, you the musicians were were at the club. They had, they had sta um, guys who were, you know, permanent jobs in, in the club. Musicians who worked, and when I took them, you know, you know the songs, and I, and I gave them a reggae song like to experience. She hates the sight of me. They'd say, what is that? And I'd sing it for them and I'd play, you know, the, the, the track for them. By that time, you know, because when I was recording in Jamaica, there was no cassettes, you know. There was, there were only um, 45 RPM records. There was no cassettes because cassettes came in, I think, about 1971, 72, you know. So you'd play them a cassette and they'd say, oh, that, that, that's a nice beat, you know, and then... You know, they'd get into it, and every time the guys played it, they'd fall in love with it. And I'd say, okay, and the next song I'm going to sing is the ballad. Which is my, they said, no, sing it in reggae. <laughs> so, you know, we started carrying, you know, the, the, the word reggae around and, and, and started spinning the music around. Now that I found this to keep me alone. So, um, the, the, the Shubin, you know, it's uh, like Jamaican patwa. You know, the word, the word shub, you know, is, is like push. So in Jamaica, we don't say push, we say shub. You know, so to get into this club, which was an illegal club, you know, you shub in, you shub the door and you go in. But it was great in, 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 these, uh, in, in these shubins because in, in the shubin, once you walk through the door, you didn't have to, to, to buy a joint. The smoke, in, in the, you'd have to cut through the smoke. <laughs> Because it was so heavily, you know, with, with smoke, you know, that you, you'd, you'd get a high right away, you know. And um, it was really dimly lit. You could hardly see, you know, uh, the, the faces, you know. And one of the main reasons for, for leaving the club and go to a Shubin is that you'd find, you know, some girls, you know. And many a time you'd pick up, a, you'd go into Shubin, meet a girl, and you'd, you'd buy her a drink or she'd buy you a drink and you'd be dancing with her. And then you'd be locking in tight, you know, having a great time. And maybe three, four, five hours later, you know, you, 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 you shove the door to get out. And when you get out, the sun is shining. And when you look at her, you think, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, but, but the shubin used to be, you know, and the other way of getting out of there is if the cops raided. <laughs> And you hear somebody shout out, police! <laughs> and it's one door in and one door out. <laughs> and when you see 60 or 70 people or 100 people trying to <laughs> get out, and most of the time the shipping would be in a basement, you know, so you had to run up the stairs. You've been knocking over cops. <laughs> so it, it, it was magic, it was lovely. You know, those days, th those were, th to talk about the good old days, those were the good old days. I was working with um, Manfred Mann's Earth Band, which was, uh, he had a studio up in uh, the old Kent Road called the Workhouse. And, um, uh, you know, there was a guy called Mike Hogg that used to play keyboards with, uh, with, with Manfred. And Mike and I were friends. I was introduced to, 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 to Mike by a guy called Stanley Pendleton. I'd done a recording, and I, I, I gave the recording to um, 
MCA. MCA took the recording and they fell in love with it and they gave us some money to start our own production company. And um, when we had this money floating around, we decided we were going to send for some people from Jamaica. So we sent for Ken Parker and Alton Ellis. I, I, I wrote this song extra careful. When I wrote it, it, it wasn't it wasn't reggae. It, it was a kind of an R and B track. So when I when I wrote it, and I got the guys together to 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 play the track, it needed that extra touch with a bass. And the only person I could think of who could play that was a guy called Philip Chen. So I called Philip. And uh, I said, I, I want you to, to play something for me. And he says, come see me. So I went by his house. He was living in, in Holland Park then. And I went and I saw him. I had to go all the way up these stairs. And when I went up, he was practicing on his bass. And all his fingertips had some extra tough skin on it. Like, like it's hard, hard, hard to explain. But we, we call them corns. In, in, in Jamaica, he had like horns on his fingers, tough, and he would be slapping the bass. And I said to him, Philip, I've got this song that, that I've recorded, and I'd like you to play the bass on it. And he said, yeah, okay, when? And I made the date, and he came up, listened to the track, and he just played this wicked bass line on it. For someone like you. When we were finished with the song, I figured it needed something else. So there were some school kids just uh, going to a university up the road. And we used to see them walking past with their instruments all the time. So I called them in one day and says, you guys want to, ever, ever been in a recording studio? They say, no. So you would you like to come in, have a look around? And when they heard it was Manfred, they went, what? And they came in, played them the track, and they fell in love with it. So they played the strings on it, right? Paid them, you know, I think it was about 15 pounds each, which is a lot of money. And they were, they were happy, loved the song. So when we sat, mixed the song, listened to it, I thought, this don't sound nothing like what I would do regular. So I decided I was going to change the name on the record and put Billy Cole instead of Winston Francis. And took it to Power Exchange, who were down in Bond Street, an American company. And the record just took off. You know, um, uh, Noel Edmonds, when he heard it, he went crazy, right? So I sent it to Jamaica to be released, and from there it, it just pff, it just laid Jamaica flat, you know. And everybody was talking about this guy Billy Cole. That even when I got there in 1975, you know, people were telling me about the record. This Billy Cole guy. <laughs> not realizing it was me, you know. And even today, a lot of people, you know, play the song and still don't know it's me. You know, but Billy Cole is Winston Francis. In the early days, you know, um, there were guys, you had some institutions, I would say. Like, you, you had Chalk Farm Records, uh, the studios, which, as, as if, if, you, if you came from Jamaica, you would end up in Chalk Farm because that was basically, you know, what a, a, a Jamaican studio w would be like, you know. And this guy, Vic Carey, he was a genius, you know. He was the guy who, he, he recorded most of the songs for Trojans, you know, in, in, uh, from, from Chalk Farm. And then you had guys like, who, who I used to work with, uh, um, um, Bill Farley. He used to work with EMI, you know, and uh, I was introduced to him by a guy called Sid Sargent, and um, did some work with with with, uh, with with Bill, and Bill introduced me to um, K.O. DeWire, who was head of EMI Publishing, and she, she and I got on very, very well, uh, wrote some really good songs for her, and re recorded the songs there, you know, at EMI. And um, then you, you had um, guys like, um, who I met, you know, later on, uh, uh, like Dennis Bovell, which is another genius, you know, great guy. So Dennis Bovell gave me a really fat paycheck. Oh, yeah. Let 
One of the, the, the other things that I must say that I'm glad I, I, I did is that I didn't go around signing a lot of papers for different different people, companies, managers, etc. Right? Because in in this business, I remember years ago when I just started, my, my first manager in Miami, Chuck Bird, said to me, now that you started on this career and this life, he said, there are a few things that I have to tell you you must try and remember. He says, try and remember the first note in music is Do. And the last note in music is Do. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. You know what I'm talking about? I said, yes, sir. He says, now, when you work, remember, if you're working, you have to get some bread. Never forget that. Always work for some bread, right? And also, be careful, right? The most important thing in, 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 in the business is writing, uh, is, is, is getting someone to put your signature to, some, to a contract because contracts can be very, very dangerous. They can be the detriment of your life, right? The end of your career. Because in, in the old days, the contracts used to have one word in it, which was, uh, um, I can't think of it. It was um, in perpetuity. Perpetuity. In, in, in perpetuity, which meant forever. So when you got a contract and it, it had that word in it and you signed it, that means they own you forever and you will never get out of that. So be careful because it's still in contracts, still in contracts. So be careful when you're signing and they wave their card before you say, sign this contract. I got 20,000 pounds for you. That could be the first and the last 20,000 pounds you ever get. So make sure that anything you're doing, get advice from, uh, for, from, from a, a proper solicitor who deals with with uh with um with 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 music you know uh and make them read through your contract make sure that you've got you're friendly with with, with your with your lawyer right don't be on his wrong side be on his right side so and then when you're ready to sign your contract make sure that he's the one who does everything for you so you'll know what you're doing Right, because this could be a very, very good business, but it can also be a bad business if you don't do it right. I love what you're doing. Thank you very much. Zion, let's go to Zion. I'm going home. When I looked, I saw him coming down the road. And when he reached up to me, you know, he says, Wom Cobra. I say, hey, Tucky. He says, what are you doing? I says, I want to get into the dance, man. Can you put me in? And he, he just picked me up and, <laughs> and threw me over the fence.